will be, of course, our, our panel on diversity and inclusion in professional wargaming. Um, we had a, a version of this panel last year, and it turned out to be hugely important because it ended up sparking an entire process that led to the, the Darby House principles and so on and so forth. So we're pleased to have that panel again. I will be handing over to uh, Brianna uh, Prasaviet in a minute to, uh, to chair it. Uh, but first of all, those of you who saw an earlier version of the program will know that uh, originally we had Sally Davis from, from DSTL speaking. Uh, we, we've ended up with Lynn and Paul instead because Sally's not been well. Um, she, in fact, is, is watching from her sick bed. I'm not, I actually have a picture of, of the view from her sick bed. I'm not going to share it, but you can see the screen, you can see the conference, and you can see all the 28 millimeter wrens that she's painting in the foreground. Um, so it is the geekiest gamer shot ever. But um, we did want to give a, a shout out to Sally. We wanted to give her the Connections North Award for all of her work on diversity and inclusion. And I'd like to invite every single person who's here to either type Get Well Sally into the, uh, into the text box or even unmute and hope that Sally, who's currently uh, pumped full of drugs, is feeling better soon. So there you go, Sally. Uh, Get well important. soon, Sally. Yeah, well soon, Sally. Hey, Sally. Feel, feel better, you. Sally. Miss hey, you, Sally. Sally. Come back, Sally. Come back uh, soon, Sally. Remember, there you, there you everything go. works better with bourbon. <laughs> Yes, yes. So what you really want to do is take medical advice from a lot of war gamers, right? You know, that's that's the way to get uh, get better soon. Um, <laughs> especially the unethical war gamer. <laughs> especially the person who just chaired the unethical war gaming breakout room. Absolutely. Um, so uh, there we go. And on that note, uh, with all, feel free to continue to offer Sally your your completely untutored medical advice in the. Uh, um, in the uh, in the chat, but I will hand over to uh, Brianna to whoops, no, that's not the next break. I will hand over to Brianna. I will stop sharing to chair the session. Rex, and thanks everyone for coming. Thank you to my panelists. I'd like to personally thank Lynn O'Donnell and Paul Strong from DSTL for filling in for Sally, uh, Yuna Wong and Sebastian Bay. Thank you for being here. And I'm just gonna dive right in. I'll start with my presentation and we'll move on to presentations from everyone else and questions. Uh, so I have a bit of a rant for myself that we're gonna start. So this is a question that I hear often. So diversity and inclusion, why are we still talking about this? And if it lets me, oh, there we go. So why should we care about diversity? Uh, this is an accepted principle in business that diversity actually lends to better firm performance for a variety of reasons. So because of the diversity uh, promotes different cognitive thinking and different skills, uh, it tends to improve firms decision making, problem solving, uh, promotes innovation, creativity and attracts the best talent. So these are all things that are really important to the wargaming and professional gaming community. So these are things that we should also care about, you know, widening the talent pool uh, by opening it to different people and my more diverse communities uh, would lend to better and more games being put out there. Um, a great example of how diversity is actually boosted performance uh, is the French World Cup teams where uh, creating a national training program and looking for people in different and wider communities has actually led to France having the most World Cup talent in the world. Um, most World Cup players um, by far, I think is 38% are born in France. And that's because of their community outreach, uh, because of a no tolerance policy for racism and sexism and uh, through better training programs with people from different areas of France. Uh, and, you know, there's proof. Uh, this panel and Connections North in general is a great example of how uh, people from different backgrounds can be great professional war gamers and game designers. And if you look at the two games below, uh, one is the 2020 uh, Best Game of the Year Award designed by a woman. And then you also have the 2019 
one of the best game nominees and best tactical and combat game winners uh, from a Canadian, Eric Lang, who is a racialized person. Um, another question I have though, is that haven't we done all enough already? Uh, hasn't racism, sexism been solved? You know, I don't personally discriminate against anyone. I can't imagine that people do. Uh, these are all headlines that I pulled from the last year, uh, which kind of puts into perspective that there's still a lot that needs to be done, particularly in the defense industry. And uh, I could have pulled more, but I didn't want to overcrowd the PowerPoint slide. Uh, so I can give everyone a second to just read uh, some of the great headlines that have come up in the news in the last year. Uh, and then everybody knows to be a good game designer, it's important to play as many games as possible. Uh, but the wargaming community in particular, as well as just the gaming community, is not necessarily tolerant of people of different backgrounds. And it kind of creates an environment which many people who are not born into, uh, you know, uh, the wargaming community or who are not typical members don't feel accepted and have a hard time breaking in. Um, so these are some things that are often experienced by people of marginalized communities. And these are some things that we want if we want to increase the uh, members of professional wargaming, we have to work to absolve. Uh, except it's not that easy because there's a lot of resistance. Uh, this is pulled from the wargaming group uh, when there is a post about War Games for Guys. And I took this comment as a bit of a challenge because that's something people often say is, oh, we wouldn't care if you started something just for women or really it's not so bad, you need to lighten up. But I created my own website and blog posts for how women are often, women in particular, because this has been my experience are treated in the war gaming community or in the gaming communities. and. I just want people to take a moment to think that, would this be okay if the shoe was on the other foot? All of these I've taken from posts that I found online and I flipped them so that the gender role is different and stuff that I've personally been told and experienced. So, yeah, you know, a lot of work needs to be done to create a better environment so more people feel uh, like they want to be members of this community. Uh, so the way forward, uh, calling people out on sexism and racism, uh, building a supportive and inclusive environment. Uh, I'm very lucky where I work at the Canadian Joint Warfare Center. Uh, I have coworkers who are very supportive of my development and include me in discussions and decision-making. Simple things like, Brianna, what do you think about this? Actually goes a very long way to make me feel heard and part of the community and makes me want to encourage other women or other people of color to be involved. Um, same as training would be game designers from more di diverse talent pools. Uh, so not just taking from the normal Morgan community, for instance, this was a discussion that was brought out last time, but really looking for different areas to pull talent. So one of the main um, areas which and it was being done through Rex and through others is uh, universities. Universities is a great way to uh, encourage more people to be professional gamers. And from that, you gain more skills and more people uh, with different perspectives and different ideas. And then lastly, it's important to normalize and promote game designers of different backgrounds. So if you are thinking about joining, but you only see white men all around you, kind of makes it a less appealing place to want to join because uh, it's important to, for people to feel like they're not going to be alone everywhere they go. And so promoting and making it normal that, yes, there are women who run war, gaming, war games. Uh, yes, there are people of color who design great games is really important to encourage other people to follow suit. Um, so anyways, that's my presentation. And I'm gonna pass the wand to uh, Yuna Wong. Thanks so much, Brianna. Um, sorry, I seem to have disappeared from my Zoom. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And um, uh, I, I can't believe it was only a year ago. I had to double check that it was only a year ago at Connections North that we started having this conversation. So if you live in the United States, what happened between last Connections North and this Connections North was 
pandemic shutdown and the Black Lives Matter movement and sort of armed insurrection of the Capitol. So I have aged at least a decade and um, I can't believe uh, so much has happened. I think from the United States, the whole discussion about diversity inclusion was really supercharged in the past year because of Black Lives Matter and the protests and all of the issues that that raised. So it's almost like the, the not only is the iron hot for having these types of discussions, at least in the United States, it's, it's red hot. Actually, it's, it's like supernova hot. Um, I think some of us are kind of worried that the focus will die down after a bit, after people have made some sort of gestures about diversity and inclusion, and could, they could easily sort of go back to the way things were. Uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, in the connections, last connections UK, we start, kicked off the women's wargaming network, uh, and you know, so that that's that that con all of that continues. Um, one of the things, though, is um, um, uh, the, the sort of demand it puts on people in any sort of field right now who are right labeled as you're the diverse person, right? So I, I hear it from not just and hear it in experience and not just from people in wargaming, but just in a variety of other fields as well. So, you know, now the demand is to put out there you know, right, organizations and communities uh, just reach out there and um, see who they can put up in the forefront that is in their in their community or in their staff who um, right, are not white and male to say, look, look, we're diverse. Or people reach out to you and say, like, you know, help us, right? So the demand signal is overwhelming uh, and we just can't, you know, right, if the numbers are already small in a field, you just can't meet everyone's demand for now, uh, you know, being representative, for now mentoring, for now being an example. So I could, you know, like it's just exhausting keeping up with the demands for, you know, things. But like, who do you who do you turn down is is, is really problematic. Um, so one of the things I really wanted to say is, yes, right now people are <clears throat> on it. It could go away, right? But um, and also those of us who are um, being asked to represent everyone now, right? Like, like I am every, literally everyone's plan for diversity and inclusion now. And again, it's just really overwhelming and I just can't, don't have the energy for everything. But the other thing is, sorry, the dog wants to be included. Um, you know, you also, anyone really has the power to change things. You don't have to wait for me or someone else to be involved, you can, um, make a difference. And I think uh, actions like the Zenobia Awards where people are trying uh, to have greater diversity and inclusion in at least historic game design is an example. And, um, and I just want to remind everyone, uh, for me in professional wargaming, every single one of my mentors were white and male. So it's not like you, it's, it's, you, you can def, anyone can make a difference. Um, and I would really encourage everyone to do it because those of us there aren't enough of, you know, people in whatever sort of whatever non-majority community you're looking at to do all of the mentoring, to do all of that. That, but um, you know, just repeating myself. But yes, you can make a difference, and um, uh, you have a lot more power than you might be giving yourself credit for. Um, also, one thing I do want to say is, um, so I am now at Institute for Defense Analyses, and they are working on being sick, becoming signatories of the Derby House principles. So look for a formal announcement from Ida soon. But those are all my comments from now. For now, thanks so much. Thanks, Yuna. Uh, Sebastian Bay, would you like to take over? Um, I'll keep my comments brief uh, because I want to focus on questions from the crowd. But my suggestion on diversity is. You know, Yuna, um, yourself, and Rex, we all brought up why diversity is important and how slow the progress has been. But I want to focus on sort of what do I do, right? Um, and that's one a question I ask myself a lot uh, as someone in the field is how can I help the next generation? How can I help my colleagues? How can I help my mentors be a bit better sometimes? Um, and my encouragement to everyone is, is to find small actions to do something, be an active ally in 
the fight for, for diversity, whether it means bringing a co-chair onto your working group, um, giving one-on-one -on -one Zoom lessons, um, or passing on a particular technique or knowledge or expertise, uh, widening someone to your, uh, widening your project team to include uh, more diverse voices. It's all about active choices and active um, actions, right? In the notion of, I'm gonna commit to do this. I'm not just gonna say, I, I am about diversity. I am about the X, Y, Z is about actually going and doing some things. And there are times uh, I myself who have been, uh, been in that place of like, oh, I could take the easier way out, right? I could, for example, for the Georgetown University of Wargaming Society, we make active approaches to not only have diverse speakers and uh, experiences, but also from fields, um, from the commercial realm, but it takes effort. It takes more effort. I could just roll up into the, the typical Rolodex, right, of people um, and make my job a lot easier, but that's not the point, right? The point is to, uh, to work harder at something that we need as a community and as an expert field. And for those who are out in the crowd, and those who have been around the block a couple of times, I, I invite you and almost you know, um, challenge you to find mentees and actively you know, find diverse voices to lift and promote and you know, pass on your knowledge, right? Um, so that's all I have to say for now. Um, Thank you so much. Such great points. Uh, Lynn and Paul, would you guys like to take over? Sure, just gonna play with technology and fail dismally. All right, I hope that picture has come up, has it? Yes, it has. It Excellent. Has. Right, so what I want to talk about is I want to talk about uh, initially uh, how all this started uh, for me. Basically, um, the Maritime Warfare Center presented me the volume because I've done some research on uh, the experience of wargaming in the past. And they found a little volume about a chap called Gilbert Roberts, who's the gentleman in the center there. And uh, um, what was fascinating about it, and I'd written on women's history before, is how it suddenly became apparent that if this conference had happened in 1945, 80% of the attendees would have been female, and about a quarter of the attendees would have been from ethnic minorities. So we've actually gone backwards quite a lot. And what the, uh, the example uh, told us was how this organization, the Western British Tactical Unit, was an exemplar of how to operate, an exemplar of how diversity can help us, and, it, and a really good example of how analysis can be done in real time, combining technology, insight, intelligence inf information, etc. Now, I took it out, published a short article on it, it went down very well, Paxims loved it, it then went into the, the Wargaming Guide, went down well in the Pentagon, the photographs, as you can see by the example I'm, I'm showing you here, went down extremely well, particularly as it enabled the next stage. And what happened, of course, as an academic, I then move on to the next subject. Sally Davis asked if she could take this further, and she did a fantastic job. What she did is she transformed the research. She took the diversity and inclusion insights and actually took it to a new level. She found numerous relatives, including some of the surviving relatives. They got to find out what some of their, their relatives had actually done. And in one lady's case, she got to read the article shortly before she, she passed away to find out how much what she had contributed to. Sally also found out how the rules actually worked, which is something I hadn't been able to discover from my initial research. And she led the engagement with the Western Approaches uh, um, Museum in Liverpool, uh, set up the war game we did with those. And then combining this with existing work on uh, dyslexia, the lectures she'd been given within the civil service, basically all of these factors do together to basically create the initial idea for the Derby House principles. And with those, she gained senior leadership buy-in. Uh, she basically got the principals to, uh, to sign up. She influenced the MOD. She influenced uh, international staff colleges. She got industrial groups to get in. Uh, she designed a badge. Uh, um, she used a survey to, to capture impressions and ideas, experiences, and then used those to create an experiences card deck, which illustrated to members of staff within our organization actually how little we had done so far. And some of the insights that we otherwise wouldn't have understood or experienced. So it turned around that perspective so we could appreciate the position of other people working that we were working with and the importance of diversity and how many micro things we were doing uh, to slow these things down. 
And this course was briefed to the executive and to the senior individuals. And since then, uh, Sally has, of course, through Paxims, uh, furthering ways, raising awareness on DNI uh, on, on our internal systems and externally in Paxims and the Wavel Room, and in addition to various awareness pieces and other uh, other examples. She's also used wargaming uh, to help counter dis discrimination, and along with me and others, have written articles and presentations to try and contribute to widening understanding. So as a result, we've now named our conference center after, after the, uh, it's now called the Derby Conference Center for obvious reasons. Apparently she's working on a film, which I look forward to seeing uh, um, about the, the experiences of Watu. Uh, and the only reason why she's not with us is because she's been fighting trolls. And uh, uh, troll fighting is hard work. It's bloody grim stuff. Uh, but as you all know, if you meet enemies, you're going in the right direction. And I look forward to Sally to returning uh, to, to her efforts very soon. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lynn, would you like to? Yeah, okay. Um, hi, I'm Lynn, and my pronouns are she and her. And I'm gonna talk about the work that I've been doing uh, together with Sally and some other people trying to make uh, DSTL more LGBT plus inclusive. So this links into Sally's uh, wider DNI work that she's done for the Derby House Principles. So we've got a number of employee support networks, which are set up to support people who've got protected characteristics and caring responsibilities. And the role of these uh, networks is like twofold. So one is to make sure that a lot of the decision making and corporate stuff is more inclusive and it, and it considers all the protected characteristics. And also it's a good way of like minded people to get to know who, who, who each other are across the, across the lab. So um, I'm, I'm the lead um, for the PRISM network, which is the sexual orientation and gender identity network. And uh, one of the things we've done is we've linked into wider networks across defense and government so we can share ideas and resources. And myself, Sally, and a couple of other people in the network have written a um, line manager's guide to supporting LGBT plus staff. And what we, what we did was we went out and we got all the relevant stuff we thought might be useful stuck it all together in one document so it covers terminology, UK legislation, uh, tips on recruitment and also uh, does like worked examples for line managers in particular situations for supporting staff. Uh, convinced our senior leadership to support this and it's, this was launched by our chief executive in October so I've been going around um, talking to line managers and briefing people in the lab so then that gave me an excuse to educate people and actually tell them what they needed to do to, to be more inclusive and welcoming for LGBT plus staff. Um, one thing we've got, which is sort of a bit like, I'll say it's a bit like the Derby House principal scheme, is we've got a straight ally scheme and we've got a badge. And so I've been going around briefing on the line manager's guide um, and PRISM and our ally scheme to people and saying, would you like a badge? And um, people go, yes, I'd like a badge. And then, then they go, well, how's that different from Sally's badge? So. Sally's badge. Um, so, and then people go, I oh, know I don't want one of your badges. I want one of the ones that say, um, quotes, I'm not a dickhead, which is what informally people are calling the Derby House Principles badge. Hang on, my notes have just disappeared, sorry. Um, we've also got um, rainbow lanyards. I've got mine on here. I can't, don't know if you can see the lights, not particularly good. And so if people are wearing those and um, allies, allies badge and also the Derby House Principles badge, that sort of indicates to people that there are friendly faces either in the office or, or online. So that's quite good. And also recently, um, line managers have been um, contacting us saying, oh, can we have some of the badges to wear for interviews so people can see that, you know, we, we are inclusive. Um, throughout the year, there's a number of um, LGBT plus awareness days. And so what we do for that is we have, if we're on site, we put up the relevant flag. Um, and we also, we've got this internal uh, blogging system called Distillery. We put a blog on there sharing uh, what, what's the importance of the day. Um, people to, can share their lived experience. And that is quite good for explaining stuff to the sort of the, the heterosexual uh, majority, like what's the importance of this. And actually, um, Paul did mention about a, a bit about um, troll fighting. And we have had some trolling on our internal system, which is unfortunate. Um, but actually, I think it's actually improved a lot since we've actually we've um, 
launched the guide and we've gone out and done these briefings. So now when we have had an awareness day, people are actually saying, you know, actually I put their hands up and say, I identify as this and, you know, and then people are having chats without people turning up and saying um, upsetting things, which has happened previously. So as a result of the Lion Mantra Sky going out and um, increasing visibility through the awareness days, we have actually increased the membership for our networks. And that then has contributed to making the lab more inclusive. Uh, just before lockdown, we uh, set up a chat room so people can support each other when they're at home and you know, or, you know they just say, oh, I need to have a chat with someone. So that works quite well. Um, if you remember, I started off by saying uh, what my pronouns were. So we've actually got a um, new uh, DSTL signature block. And as part of that, I, I convinced the executive to allow us to put our pronouns in there. So we've um, now got that in there and that's all been agreed. And one of my senior sponsors has actually convinced most of the executive to put their pronouns in there. So then when they, they send stuff out, it shows that, you know, from the leadership down that we should be supportive. Um, also with the pronouns, we've written a one pager actually saying what, what is the importance of pronouns? Why should people declare their pronouns? And why, why should, it's obvious, you know, you know, I'm a woman, why should I tell you, tell you what my pronouns are? What's the importance of it? Just to try and make it more obvious for people. We've also been working with um, our HR department to improve LGBT um, inclusion and improve, just recommending um, improvements in how they communicate and also improving a diversity data they collect. And so February in the UK is LGBT plus history month. I know it's, it's black history month in, in the States, but over here it's um, LGBT history month. And so um, we've also been doing for that, we've been doing daily blogs to actually highlight some of the awesome things that queer and gender non-conforming people have done and how they've contributed to military history and people that you will have heard of and actually didn't realize that you know they weren't they weren't straight cisgender people and I can't don't think Paul mentioned this but last year um, Paul and Sally did a talk which we called Queeros so Queer Heroes um, that they recorded that again in lockdown and that's actually on YouTube so hopefully someone can stick up a a link to that. Also, um, I've got our executive sponsor to record a video to actually address some of the stuff that Sally's um, said in her last DNI essay. So, um, hoping this was going to be out on social media soon. We've got like a week left for the month, so I'm hoping that will be out soon. So, it's drawing attention to the essays. He's saying what it means to him to be a straight ally and asking straight people to get involved. So, we're not just saying stuff and nobody's taking any notice. And also it shouldn't be the diverse people who are doing all the heavy lifting on diversity and inclusion and calling out homophobia, transphobia and any other discrimination. It's just not on either at work, you know, at work or, or outside, which is awful. Um, another thing that we've done is um, Kirsty Mills, who was also uh, one of the wrens at the Awatu um, recreation game. She took um, some of the results from uh, Sally's survey, which went into the experiences deck. So actually try and understand what the issues are for women and minorities on trials. So why do some people not want to go on trials? What's, what's the issue? I mean, it could be things like, I know when I've gone on a trial, it's like, well, where's the toilet? Where am I going to go to, you know, where am I going to go to the loo, et cetera. So, um, and, and made recommendations on how, how it can improve. So appointing a, a diversity and inclusive trials manager. So there's a person, if you have an issue, you know who to go to. Introducing a system of reporting, so a bit like a sort of health and safety system, and all the DSTL people to wear um, branded polo shirts so you know who your colleagues are if they need support. And everyone who goes on the trials is going to go on a, a course called Active Bystanders course, so it, it sort of trains you how to support your colleagues. So that's a quick waffle of stuff I could think of that might be relevant. So impressive that you guys managed to do all of that. That's awesome. And the importance of being a good ally too is so important that it can't just be, you know, racialized communities, LGBT or women continuously calling out and developing these initiatives. You know, there's no reason why, you know, the other white men in the wargaming community and professional gaming community can't also, you know, notice that they're 
coworker is being discriminated against and do something about it.